Three centuries after the first discoveries, Egypt continues to fascinate us. Every month that goes by reveals new treasures buried under the desert sand. This fragment of nose was found in the area during an archaeological dig, so it was stuck back on. It hadn't gone far. Temples, pyramids, necropolises and ancient cities are just some of the wonders that bear witness to the splendour of past pharaohs and their heirs. The Greeks used to make cakes called pyramids. When they came to Egypt, they found colossal stone structures in the shape of their cakes, so they gave them the same name. This ancient civilization, which was thought to have been lost, is constantly reinventing itself in the Egypt of the 21st century. We are going to travel through time and space to rediscover it. On the north coast of Egypt lies Rosetta, where the Nile flows into the Mediterranean Sea at the end of its 7,000 kilometer long journey, which starts in the heart of Africa. It was in this city that the key to the culture of the pharaohs was discovered in 1799. The Rosetta Stone helped French Egyptologist Jean-Francois Champollion uncover the mystery of hieroglyphs. From then on, archeologists could read ancient Egyptians like an open book and they discovered that the Nile was far more than just a river. The pharaoh's subjects worshipped it, celebrated it, and associated it with numerous deities. The Nile and its delta have been the country's greatest asset since the dawn of time. Without this life force, Egypt would be merely a vast and sterile expanse of desert. Upstream from the delta, the Nile is a majestic river. On its banks lies the current capital, Cairo, founded by the Arabs in the 7th century. Today, the river must wind its way as best as it can through this megalopolis of 16 million inhabitants. It is a sprawling city which stretches almost as far as the Giza pyramids. Today, these wonders of the ancient world lie eight kilometers from the riverbank. But in the days of the pharaohs, the Nile flowed right past them. That was how the millions of blocks of stone needed to build these colossal 4,500-year-old structures were transported. To gain a better understanding of the role and the importance of the Nile in Egypt's 4,000-year-old culture, we must go further upstream to the south, where it is the shape of a green snake winding its way through the hostile deserts. In Luxor, on the site of the ancient city of Thebes, the river has always governed the daily life of the locals. The river traffic is dense there. Egypt is a big country, and the Nile covers a distance of 1,200 kilometers. The river remains the natural link between north and south. You find all sorts of boats on it, from modest dinghies used by local residents to cruise ships transporting hundreds of tourists who have come here to visit the wonders of the ancient heritage sites, such as Luxor Temple, for example. There is one boat which causes a sensation every time it passes, and it has been doing so for 100 years. And that's the legendary paddle steamer, Sudan. You are on board the oldest and most unique boat on the Nile. This boat was built in 1885 for the Egyptian royal family, for King Fuad and his son Farouk, who became the last king of Egypt. This was Agatha Christie's boat. In 1934, she and her husband were invited to spend a few days in Egypt. She began her stay in the old Winter Palace Hotel in Luxor. Then she boarded the paddle steamer Sudan and ended her trip in the old Cataract Hotel in Aswan. 
While she was on board, Agatha Christie wrote the first few chapters of her book, Death on the Nile. Since the 19th century, the Western world has had a fascination for Egypt, to the extent that we talk about Egyptomania. And when Agatha Christie set her novel, Death on the Nile, amongst Egyptian antiquities, she knew its success was guaranteed. The 30-kilometer long mountain chain opposite Luxor helped contribute to the craze for all things Egyptian. In it lies a site which captured everyone's imagination, the Theban necropolis. Archaeologists have uncovered over 600 tombs here, the most famous of which are those of Tutankhamun and Nefertiti, the wife of Ramesses II. But each year that passes brings a new set of discoveries. Omeima has explored every nook and cranny of these desert valleys. This was her childhood dream. She fulfilled it when she became an Egyptologist, specializing in the Theban necropolis. We are in front of the tomb of Rek Mira, who was a vizier during the reign of Tutmos III. Viziers were a bit like modern-day prime ministers, so he was a very important man. Here, we have a whole wall decorated with scenes showing the Egyptian people bringing gifts to Rek Mira. You can see all sorts of things. Herds of oxen, cows, calves, crates full of pigeons, piles of grain, jars of beer and wine. There are also trays of bread. These round loaves are typical of Egypt, and you still find them today. They are called shamsi, which means sunbread, because they are left out in the sun to rise. They are dense, wholemeal loaves. This shows us the riches that came from the Nile, from the silt of the Nile and from its flood waters, from this green band of water, this green snake, which is the lifeblood of Egypt. Without the Nile, Egypt would not exist and would never have existed. We wouldn't be here today. 96% of Egypt's population of 100 million still lives on the banks of the Nile. On both sides of the river lies fertile agricultural land. The water from the Nile has always been diverted, channeled and harnessed for irrigation purposes. To water their crops, ancient Egyptians used a shadouf. This was a tool with a lever mechanism used to draw water from the river by hand. Shadoufs were still in use in the late 20th century. Today, they have been replaced by pumps, which are more practical but less environmentally friendly. Jibril, like his ancestors, helps himself to water from the river to water his cornfields. Water is scarce here. The only source of water is the Nile. That's why we're lucky to live near the river. It depends on the season, but we need a lot of water for our crops. From here, right up to the sugarcane fields near the desert, everything is irrigated by the Nile. That's a distance of about five kilometers. The Nile is the lifeblood of Egypt because we are a very agricultural nation. The river is what matters most to us. There is a famous saying that Egypt is a gift from the Nile, and it's true. At Gurna, the town opposite Luxor, the benefits of the Nile are felt as far as the desert. Every plot of land is cultivated. Some are too small for a tractor. 
So, farmers like Mohammed use an ancient technique, the swing plough. A plough is better than a tractor. The tyres tamp down the soil too much. If a tractor were to drive over here, there would be lots of soil with nothing growing in it. It's better to use oxen. We inherited this technique from our ancestors. It's a technique which dates back to the time of the pharaohs. The ancient Egyptians used a plough pulled by oxen. You can see images on some of the tombs around here. The swing plough hasn't changed since antiquity. The ancient Egyptians did not use iron. The ploughshare was made of wood. Nowadays, it is made of metal. But the biggest difference between now and then is today's farmers own their land, whereas the whole of Egypt used to belong to the pharaoh. This is our legacy, so we look after it. Before he died, my father said to me, this plough will bring you luck. I asked him why. He replied, if you have a small plot of land surrounded by fields, you can use the plough to work the land without disturbing your neighbours. Then they will pray for you, because you were careful with their crops. And he was right. That is important. In the distance, behind the fields of corn and sugarcane, lies the Theban mountain with its necropolis. The inhabitants of Gurna rarely venture that far. Only a few of them have found work there, more often than not, as tomb attendants. Yet not long ago, their village stood in that spot. Living in close proximity to the dead didn't seem to bother their ancestors. In the 19th century, an archaeologist who came here found the owner of the house sleeping in a sarcophagus, in a coffin. Thousands of people lived in the village, and sadly, a few years ago, it was razed to the ground. To preserve the site, in the 1950s, the authorities decided to destroy what people here call Old Gurna. Traces of the village can be seen all over the site, but it is in the tomb of Karawef that you really get a feel for the intense activity that went on here, back when the living rubbed shoulders with the dead. Karawef was the steward of Tia, the great royal wife of Amenhotep III and mother of the famous Akhenaten. This tomb is very beautiful, but it is not only tourists and archaeologists who think so. Come and see. This network of underground galleries is like a Swiss cheese. I'm not suggesting that mice have been here, but humans have, the inhabitants of old Gurna searching for buried treasure. Tomb robbers definitely used to live down here. You can see dark patches on the ceiling from the soot that built up here over the years. You can just imagine these men searching, making holes here and there, like this one, for example. Thanks to the robbers, we can pass from one tomb to the next throughout the whole of Old Gurna. All that remains of Old Gurna are these ruins, but life goes on. Opposite the ruins, New Gurna is celebrating a very important local event this evening, a wedding. At weddings, 
it is traditional for people to come and greet the bride and groom and to perform a dance for them on horseback, as you can see here. The family and friends of the two families pay their respects in the afternoon. And the wedding ceremony takes place the next day or the day after. Ancient Egyptians did not ride horses. It was only when they fought the Hyksos from Anatolia in the 16th century BC that they discovered this wonderful animal. The first horses were a very small breed, only about 1.2 meters tall. It was impossible to mount them, so they had to be harnessed to a chariot. Ramesses II's chariot was an excellent example. He would drive his horses with the reins tied round his waist to leave his hands free to shoot his bow and arrow. Throughout ancient Egyptian history, horses remained a luxury and one of the most formidable weapons of the pharaoh's army. With the arrival of the Arabs in the 7th century and their equestrian tradition, horses became what they are now in Gurna, a sign of wealth and of masculine pride. <laughs> it is dusk in Gurna, the time when the town comes alive. In these ordinarily calm streets, music fills the air. On a patio away from prying eyes, the men are continuing the wedding celebrations. The horse is still the guest of honor, only this time the rider has to show off his skills as a trainer. The horses dance alongside the men to the rhythm of tambourines and mizmars, which are an early form of trumpet. No party is complete in Egypt without a stick fight or tartib. This is an ancient tradition that comes from training the pharaoh soldiers. This martial art has very precise rules that were established in about 3200 BC. It is still practiced today. The first of the two fighters to graze the face of his opponent is declared the winner. Contact must remain symbolic and the fight must be simulated. Over the centuries, Tartib became more of a dance than a fight, shifting from a military register to a martial arts one, thanks to the practice of local farmers. In the early hours of the morning, the wedding celebrations are still in full swing. The men are starting to show signs of tiredness through the smoke from their shishas. Every morning, hot air balloons fly over the ancient site of Thebes. When the winds are favorable, lucky passengers get to see the biggest ancient temple of all, Karnak. It is home to one of the most important gods in ancient Egypt, Amon. Only priests can enter. Every day they lay offerings in front of Amon's statue, food to give him the energy he needed to unite the universe. But his energy is contagious, so Karnak has high walls to protect the uninitiated from contamination. For ancient Egyptians, Karnak was the equivalent of a nuclear power station and the god Amon was the nuclear reactor. It was a useful place, but a dangerous one. We are now standing on the famous Sphinx Alley, a three-kilometer-long road linking Karnak and Luxor. This was the processional route taken by Ramesses II for the celebration of the Feast of Opet, 
During the second month of the Nile floods in the inundation season. The Feast of Apet is one of the most important festivals in ancient Egypt. It celebrates the start of the Nile floods. This was the only time in the year when the priests would bring out statues of the gods. It was also the only opportunity for ancient Egyptians to see Amon. The god must be united with his wife, Mut. The pharaoh is present because he is the only person able to communicate directly with Amon. The union between Mut and Amon symbolizes fertility because the silt deposited by the river fertilizes vast areas of Egyptian soil every year. I am standing on Egyptian soil that dates back to 1100 to 1200 BC, era of Ramesses II. But if you look at the lower part of the mosque, at the level of the door there, that was built in the 12th century AD. So, 2,500 years later, or a bit less even, because the temple was still in use in Roman times. So, less than a thousand years later, this part of the temple was covered in mud, six meters deep. Clearing the temple led to a rediscovery of this jewel of ancient Egypt, but the original entrance to the mosque had to be ditched and then transformed into a window with an unrestricted view over the great court of Ramesses II. In ancient Egypt, the floods marked the start of the calendar year. As with so many events at the time of the pharaohs, the date was decided by the Nile. 150 kilometers upstream, at the temple of Kom Ombo, the proof is etched into the stone for anyone who knows how to read hieroglyphs. Samir certainly does. He is a Copt. This Christian community was present in Egypt long before the Arab conquest in 640 AD. Copts are direct descendants of ancient Egyptians. Samir owes his passion for Egyptology to his desire to gain a better understanding of his origins. Part of the answer is to be found on the walls of Komombo in the form of this perfectly preserved calendar. The dates were dictated by the Nile and its caprices, and the calendar is still used by the Coptic Church and by many Egyptians. The same calendar is still followed by farmers in Egypt, and it is also the liturgical calendar of the Coptic Church. Ancient Egyptians invented this 365-day calendar, or, to be exact, this 360-day calendar plus five feast days at the end of the year. The 365 days are divided into 12 months of 30 days each, and the 12 months were spread over three seasons, the inundation, the emergence, and the harvest. The ancient Egyptian calendar started in mid-July, around the time of the Nile floods. Let me show you an example. This is the first day of the third month of the season of the inundation. And this is the second day and the third day and so on. This is the calendar we've inherited. Modern day calendars have 365 days a year. So they were invented by the ancient Egyptians. The Nile has always organized the lives of Egyptians down to the smallest details. But in addition to being a life force, the river is synonymous with danger. And at the time of the pharaohs, anything that represented a threat was turned into a deity. Komombo is the house of Sebek, the god with the head of a crocodile. He is the protector of the Nile, but he is also a troublemaker who had to be appeased at all costs. At Komombo, Archaeologists found hundreds of crocodile mummies, proof of an ancient cult. Voyez. 
Quite a few crocodile remains were found in the necropolis. Some of them are huge, very important. The ancient Egyptians didn't deify or worship the whole species, just an individual crocodile, chosen according to specific criteria. And that crocodile was considered to be a living god. It was pampered and fed honey pastries. It was presented with crowns of flowers. It really was treated like a god. Then, then when it died, it was mummified like a god. The Nile used to be full of crocodiles and it was dangerous for Egyptians to bathe in it back then, given how many of them were lurking in its waters. Today, there are hardly any crocodiles left on the banks of the Nile, but another animal continues to terrorize and command the respect of locals. This animal can be seen on numerous ancient carvings. It is the cobra, and it acted as a bodyguard to the pharaoh when it was in attack mode. Both now and then, the best way to spot a cobra is to go to a busy neighborhood and look for a snake charmer, or rather, a snake hunter. That is how Atef makes his living, like his father before him and his father's father before that. He captures unwanted snakes from houses or out in the fields and then trains them to entertain bystanders. It's a very sought after job, because these snakes end up in people's houses. As soon as people spot one, they call me. I'm the only snake charmer left around here. As soon as I catch them, I put them in a basket like this. They live in these baskets until they die. They die of natural causes. I don't kill them. I couldn't do that. Obviously, the first thing I do is remove their fangs. Then I put them in front of me like this to get them used to me. And then I start training them. It's very simple. If they try to escape, I catch hold of their tail and put them back in front of me until they get used to me and stop trying to escape. I was only bitten once when catching a snake. The bite completely paralyzed my finger, and I had to have surgery on it. My finger remained stuck in this position. I had an operation to straighten it out, and it went back to normal. It was a cobra that did that to me, one like this, the same species, but that one was more aggressive and very wild. Plus, it was much fatter. No problem. That's one of the keys. <laughs> Wild animals weren't the only danger faced by the ancient Egyptians. The Nile is a capricious river. When the floodwaters got out of control, they destroyed everything in their wake. The temple of Kom Ombo still bears the scars. The temple looks complete, but in actual fact, the front is missing. On this side, you have the outer wall, but there is only one door jam. You have to imagine a door there and the outer wall built of mud bricks, which continued along there. It was carried away by the Nile. This is a blatant example of the violence of the Nile and its floodwaters. Of course, the Nile has a nourishing side to it. 
But in the case of severe flooding, it can be very destructive and dangerous. In times of heavy flooding, the Nile swept up and often destroyed everything in its midst. Sometimes the riverbed didn't return to its original level. It would change on a whim. To protect themselves from the river's worst extremes, the Egyptians would build mud brick walls. Karnak Temple, for example, is surrounded by a gigantic dike. Building it was a humongous task, which must have taken the pharaoh's brickmakers several centuries to complete. You can see them here, with their tools in this bas-relief. To gain a better understanding of the techniques involved, we visit a modern-day brickmaker. Abdallah Salem and his colleagues make bricks, and their methods haven't changed since the time of the pharaohs. The first stage is to mix earth, straw and water. Next, we pour the mixture into rectangular moulds, line them up, and then leave them to dry in the sun. People grow up learning this profession, and when they die, someone else takes up the torch and history repeats itself. We must protect our heritage. We make between 1,000 and 1,100 bricks a day. Look at these, for example. The first stage is finished. These are unfired bricks, and some people use them like this. But other people prefer fired bricks. It's up to individuals to choose what they want to build their house with. In our village, Everybody uses unfired bricks because they are much better adapted to our climate. Fired bricks don't fare so well in very hot weather. The Nile floods would mobilize the entire population of Egypt under the pharaohs. It was a constant source of worry. Further south, towards the modern city of Aswan, there was an obstacle on the river, the first cataract. This collection of rocks would disappear and reappear, depending on the water level. Elephantine Island is one of the biggest islands in the first cataract. To get there, Sameh boards a traditional Nile river boat. We are on board a felucca. A felucca is a traditional Egyptian sailing boat. The Nile has been Egypt's main through there since the time of the ancient Egyptians. Sailing was the most comfortable and fastest way to travel. The prevailing wind in Egypt is a northerly wind, which blows the boats against the current. The Nile's current goes from south to north in the opposite direction to the wind, which is what makes it possible to sail in both directions. Elephantine Island was essential for military operations in ancient Egypt. From here, they could watch over the Nile, prevent invasions from the south by boat, and control the ivory trade after which the island is named. The island isn't just located in an important strategic position. It is also the first point of reference for monitoring the floods. The measuring system the pharaohs used remained in place until the 20th century and can be found all along the river as far north as the delta. 
We are in a nilometer on Elephantine Island. This nilometer was used until relatively recently to measure flood levels. These are the graduations from the 19th century, the Muslim era. And on the left, you have the graduations from the time of the pharaohs. So, when the flood waters rose, they flowed in here and gradually filled the millimeter. The priests used these graduations to estimate the force of the flood water and the speed at which it would rise. If there was too much water, they had to build shelters. And if there was not enough water, they had to dig ponds to retain as much of it as possible. It was a vital and very important role of the king of Egypt to manage the floodwaters of the Nile and to regulate water supplies for the crops. In ancient Egypt, everything was thought to be connected to the deities. If there was a bad flood, it was because Kanum was unhappy. Kanum, with his ram's head, is one of the most important gods in the Egyptian pantheon. His name means master of the water, and he controls the Nile floods. Kanum resides on Elephantine Island, which is the focal point of his kingdom, the first cataract. The cataracts are the rocks, mostly granite, which covered this whole region back in the day. The Nile has carved out a path through them. You have to imagine this region in the season of inundation, with the water swirling between all these rocks. In ancient Egyptian mythology, this was the source of the Nile. If Kanum is the god of the Nile's floods, Happy was the god of its source. He lives on the riverbed, in a cave under the cataract. Water spurts out of a jar in his hands. Happy embodies the benevolent aspect of the Nile. He is portrayed as an androgynous figure with a bust and a belly. Happy personifies fertility. When he is with his double, he represents the link between Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt, between the papyrus and the lotus. The Nile's floodwaters no longer reach the first cataract. A few kilometers upstream from Elephantine Island, a concrete and steel monstrosity is blocking the way, bringing this capricious river under control. The Aswan Dam has usurped Kanum, the god of the floods. At over four kilometers long and 111 meters high, the dam is a match for the Great Pyramid, taking up 17 times more space. Since it was built in 1970, this giant structure has transformed Egypt. Today, Egyptian farmers have three harvests a year instead of just one, but there is a price to pay. Chemical fertilizers have replaced the silt from the flood waters. Nowadays, the Aswan Dam is a tourist attraction. It is a source of pride for Egyptians and for those who built it. Roshti was just 22 when he was recruited to work on this vast building site. I was here 55 years ago, so you can imagine the feelings I have now. Let you imagine the shape of the environment at that time. You see this place, actually, I mean, at that time it wasn't clean and uh, marvelous like this. It was hills and valleys of sand and rocks and all of that. I mean, this was our offices. We found ourselves in 1960, the beginning of the High Dam and the beginning of what we call it, changing the mood of the Egypt itself, actually. From a small country to a country which has the goodwill to start building something like the High Dam. That's why 
I like to talk about the high dam. It's not because an engineering sense, but I'm talking about the uh, psychological meaning about it. In the 1960s, Nasser ruled Egypt. A fervent defender of Arab nationalism, he wanted to proclaim the independence of his country to the whole world. The Aswan Dam became his great achievement. The United States refused to fund it, so NASA appealed to the Soviet Union and was successful. Work started in 1960. 36,000 workers toiled day and night in temperatures sometimes exceeding 55 degrees. There were numerous accidents. The official number of victims was over 500. We had a lot of sacrifices. We had a lot of people dying on this project, actually. But the conclusion in, in, the, in the end of it, actually, that we are standing there now, seeing that this project is living among all of us. Abdel Karim worked on the dam and survived. He was born and bred in Aswan. At the age of 91, the dam remains the biggest adventure of his life. Long live Egypt. Long live Egypt. Long live Egypt. Now I can talk to you about the dam. When construction started, I was working on a dangerous site. Everything collapsed on top of the workers and lots of people were killed. Work was halted and the biggest machines were banned from the site. We had to continue by hand using shovels. It took all our strength to lift the big stones with ropes. Yes, people died, but it was for a good cause, the Aswan Dam. Oh. This is the letter that Gamal Abdul Nasser sent me once the dam was finished. It's a thank you letter. I'm proud of my contribution. I'm glad I helped build the Aswan Dam. I did it for Egypt. Upstream from Aswan, the construction of the dam has had a drastic consequence, the creation of Lake Nasa, a vast reservoir of water covering an area of over 500 kilometers encompassing the entire region of Nubia. After thousands of years in existence, the monuments of Nubia are at risk from flooding. The most prestigious of all these archaeological treasures are the Abu Simbel temples. Richard Lebeau is a French Egyptologist. He found his calling at the age of 14 when he visited the Tutankhamun exhibition in Paris in 1967. Since then, he has traveled to Egypt over a hundred times. For Richard, Abu Simbel is still one of the most magical places in the world. In front of you, you have a monumental temple belonging to Ramesses II. It has a 20-meter-high colossus. This was the first time a pharaoh had dared to represent himself as a god. This temple is a miracle. It almost disappeared under Lake Nasser. 42 nations came to the rescue with $36 billion just a week or two before disaster struck. The operation to save the Abu Simbel temples was launched on 1st of April 1964. It was a race against the clock. For eight years, 900 people worked on it day in, day out. First, 
they had to build a dike to protect the site from rising flood water. Then, workers divided Abu Simbel up into 1,035 blocks, each weighing 20 to 30 tons. The four seated giants and the six other monumental statues were dug out by hand. The most delicate phase could now begin. It involved transporting this giant jigsaw puzzle 64 meters upstream. Jacks, cranes, and extremely powerful winches were used to raise these huge blocks to the top of the cliff. Finally, artificial hills were built to recreate the original setting for the two Abu Simbel temples. This is an extraordinary site in terms of technique. Digging up a temple is highly risky and a real challenge. In those days, the world had no concept of universal heritage. It was saving the monuments of Nubia, including the Abu Simbel temples, which gave rise to UNESCO's famous list of World Heritage buildings. The first building on that list was Abu Simbel. This is the second temple of Abu Simbel, the one Ramesses II dedicated to his famous wife, Nefertiti. In addition to being a devoted lover, Ramesses II was a great politician. He knew that the prosperity of Egypt depended on his domination of Nubia. And at the bottom of this inscription that you see here, he is presented as the master of Nubia, today and always. Nubia was an important region for the pharaohs. It is rich in gold mines, and ivory and African slaves passed through here. The trouble was that the Nubians were inclined to rebel as soon as they got the chance. The pharaohs from northern Egypt tried everything to pacify this rebellious region. This is a column of prisoners their hands tied behind their back and on their knees. These people are easily identifiable by their negroid traits. The significance of this frieze, which was on the outside of the temple, was to show Egyptians that the Nubians had been conquered and that this defeat would affect them throughout history until the end of time. This World Heritage Site was saved, but the Nubian population was forgotten. There was no sign of the paradise NASA had promised them after the construction of the dam, and 100,000 of them were displaced. In the village of Abu Simbel, behind the artificial hills sheltering the temples, a few traces of this ancient culture can still be found. Fikri does all he can to preserve it. He once used to sing about this lost paradise. Now he is trying to preserve remnants of it. I am part of the last generation to have experienced Nubia back in the day. I used to play in front of the temples of Abu Simbel when the facade stretched down towards the river. We would travel by Feluca from our village on the opposite bank. We would come here to the temples to play. I have happy memories of it. The whole of Nubia was here. That was the village of Abu Simbel, one of the 44 villages in Nubia, which stretched from the border with Sudan down to Aswan. The 44 villages in Nubia were dotted all along the Nile Valley. The landscape you see today between Luxor and Aswan remains more or less unchanged, just had more palm trees. There used to be millions of palm trees here but they have all disappeared, 60 meters beneath the lake. No one can imagine what it was like. Today it is deserted. 
There is a lake here now, but life was different then. There were felucas on the Nile. That life has completely disappeared under the lake. UNESCO hasn't done much to save it, nor has the Egyptian government or anybody else for that matter. If we don't try to safeguard this part of our culture, it will disappear forever. Nubian culture is at risk of disappearing, and yet it has lasted for centuries. In particular, the architecture, with its domes and vaults designed especially to withstand the heat of the desert. The music is a reflection of the people too. Some of the instruments are straight out of the pharaonic era. Modern-day Egypt has made the pharaoh's wish come true to bring the Nile under control, whatever the price. Most Egyptians have had to adapt. Despite coming from the delta, these fishermen at Lake Nasser look as if they've been here forever. However, a new element has appeared in the heart of the African continent. Ethiopia has also built a dam over the Nile. The Ethiopians can now control the flow of the river too, so the Egyptians are not the only masters of the Nile. This represents a new challenge for the country, where, since the time of the pharaohs, the Nile has been synonymous with Egypt, and Egypt has been synonymous with the Nile. <laughs>